Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Tonight, tackling affordability with your tax dollars. The multi-billion dollar housing plan, including a ban on foreign buyers. You will see significant investment. What we've learned, you can expect from tomorrow's budget. Provinces roll out fourth doses, but should you wait to roll up your sleeve? Like, how many boosters am I going to be getting a year here? When is the right time for your next shot? They parked, went shopping, and got towed. Said, so if you pay, I will call the guy. Then he will tell you where is your car. A CBC News investigation. And BC's school lunch debate. Should hot dogs and cookies be off limits? Everyone loves a good cheat day, you know? The push for healthy eating that some say goes too far. This is The National. Less than 24 hours to go until the federal budget is unveiled here on Parliament Hill. But we have new details tonight about what's in it for you. With inflation soaring, prices climbing, and affordability for many feeling out of reach, tomorrow is expected to bring some major moves to try and tackle one of the biggest challenges for Canadians, housing. Expect $10 billion in spending and a two-year ban on foreign home buyers, but with a few exceptions. David Cochran breaks down what else we know about where money is going. Oral questions, question or all. One day before the budget, MPs gathered in the House to argue about buying a home. Can the Prime Minister admit that actually he doesn't have a clue as to what to do with this housing crisis? You will see significant investments in housing, uh, in supports for families. Those investments, sources say, will be worth about $10 billion to help municipalities speed up home construction, to build affordable housing and finance co-op housing. The government will also set up a tax-free first home savings account for Canadians under 40 and ban foreign home buyers for two years with some exceptions, such as permanent residents and students high tax, high spend budget from the NDP Liberal Coalition, one that promises to drive up inflation. The Conservatives warn more big spending will lead to big problems. But the budget will also respond to the big challenges of the moment. Sources tell CBC News the government will invest heavily in buying weapons for Ukraine and put up to $8 billion in new defense spending an investment that will lean heavily on improving the military's ability to defend North America. Okay, I think they fit perfectly. They look great. The finance minister spent budget eve buying new shoes, a Canadian tradition, but a photo op Christia Freeland skipped last year because of the pandemic. It's been especially tough mm -hmm. getting through COVID, and I am very, very conscious of that. But now that the country has largely moved past the worst of COVID, so will the budget, making good on election promises and living up to the terms of the political deal with the NDP by laying the foundation for a national dental plan. Okay, so David, a lot of new spending. How big will this budget be? Well, we're talking billions here, but despite all of that, sources say this budget is going to be a step back towards normal budgeting and pre-pandemic spending levels. The massive support programs like CERB, they're gone. That lowers costs. The economy is rebounding. That creates revenue to cover the new spending and reduce the deficit. Now, politically, there's two goals here. To show Main Street Canadians that this government is serious about the affordability crisis and to show Bay Street that it's serious about getting finances back on track. But one thing we know Bay Street won't like is that this budget is going to slap a 3% surtax on banks and insurance companies that earn more than a billion dollars a year. That's another liberal election promise and, Andrew, another condition of their deal with the NDP. David Cochran in Ottawa, lost to watch for tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. And do tune in to CBC News tomorrow for special budget coverage and analysis. It all begins at 3 p.m. Eastern on CBC News Network, followed by live specials on CBC Television, CBC News Network, and CBC Radio at 4 p.m. Eastern. Well, the federal government has approved a controversial oil project off the coast of Newfoundland and Labrador. This is a big one for Newfoundland and Labrador. We've worked tirelessly to make sure this critical economic driver, not maybe, but will be a reality for our province. Premier Andrew Fury today on the approval of Beju Nord. The plan will see Norwegian oil company Equinor developing an oil field about 500 kilometers east of St. John's. 
While the project is seen as critical to Newfoundland's economic recovery, environmental groups say it undermines Canada's climate efforts. Today, the federal environment minister defended the approval, saying there are strict conditions attached. For the first time in the history of Canada, we're, we're demanding, it's a condition to the project going forward, that the project be net zero, carbon neutral by, by 2050. We've never made that request of any other project proponent before. Beijing Nord could begin pumping oil as early as 2028. It's expected to be able to produce up to 200,000 barrels a day. Well, turning to Canada's COVID-19 situation now, and more evidence the virus is spreading faster than previously thought. Several provinces are now speeding up access to fourth shots. But some Canadians are asking, is now the right time? Christine Birak looks into it. As far as viral waves go, it's becoming harder to ignore what's showing up in the water in cities across the country. Estimates show Ontario's COVID-19 wastewater signal now matches the peak of the Omicron wave. This is something that we are sure that we're going to be able to get through. There is no cause for panic that this was anticipated. With public health restrictions lifting, the virus was bound to spread. But experts say it's moving faster than expected, and all eyes are turning to hospitals. We'll probably, keyword probably, have fewer hospitalizations during this wave versus our last wave. Along with those who are immunocompromised, fourth doses are opening up to more Canadians. Ontario announced anyone over 60 will become eligible this week. Quebec will do the same next week, and BC and Alberta are moving to 70. Question is, will Canadians get another shot? I must say I'm sort of skeptical, but I'm not going to turn it down because I can't afford to. It seems like it's getting worse again. But does this fourth one work against the new variants? Israel's already given fourth doses to more than a million people over 60. This published study found the added shot boosted protection against Omicron infections and severe illness, but only for a month or so. I think this is actually going to be a rumbling wave. With the virus surging, some experts insist the shot is worth it. Omicron will just sneak through anyone who hasn't got a really fresh vaccination with really high levels of antibodies. But doctors are also asking the same questions many Canadians are, including whether to wait until fall when the virus is expected to surge again. I also know that if things are waning after several weeks, like how many boosters am I going to be getting a year here? Right now, there's no clear answer to that. But all of the experts we spoke with said if they were offered another dose at some point, they'd take it. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. China's largest city is reeling from a serious COVID-19 outbreak, as well as the severe measures employed to contain it. Shanghai and its 26 million residents remain under total lockdown. And with food and supplies running low, fear and anger are running high. Julia Wong takes a closer look. In Shanghai, patience is wearing thin. In a video posted to social media, a man screams, what do I eat? What do I drink? The city of 26 million is under lockdown as the government tries to stamp out cases of COVID-19. Residents are running out of necessities and frustrations are boiling over. Drones are being used to broadcast messages, urging people to comply with restrictions. People cannot easily get out, um, so they will often they find it there's a shortage of supplies. Shanghai's convention center is being transformed into a temporary hospital to battle this latest wave. Those who test positive must stay at this or other designated sites. The numbers of new locally transmitted confirmed COVID-19 cases and asymptomatic carriers are rising fast, this Chinese health official says. Community transmission in some localities has not been curbed yet. Which means mass testing in China's most populous city, something every single resident must do. In China, we have a government locking down the city of Shanghai and all its people for the common good, and people accept that. China has locked down other cities to curb spread, though none as large as Shanghai. There are no indications China is willing to budge on its COVID-0 strategy, despite concerns it may be unsustainable. The longer it lasts, um, the more inconvenience it's going to cost the citizens uh, in this megacity. I think it's just difficult for China to kind of walk back 
from a policy it believes to have achieved success in the past. Until then, residents here will remain locked down indefinitely. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. To the war in Ukraine now, one that is proving increasingly brutal, even as it shifts away from Kiev. Despite early skepticism of Russia's claims over the past few days, it has almost completely withdrawn from Ukraine's north. For now, the war is in the south and the east. Defenders in Mariupol, or what's left of it, are still resisting a block-by-block -block Russian assault. Meanwhile, between Kharkiv and the Donbass, Russian attacks have increased. This is now one of the most dangerous areas in Ukraine for both soldiers and civilians. Chris Brown shows us how the horrors revealed in Kiev's suburbs and the glimpses of it in Mariupol are adding urgency to the evacuation of towns facing the next Russian offensive. And a warning for you, some of the images you're about to see are graphic. With Russia possibly about to launch a new offensive in eastern Ukraine, in villages such as Derhachi, people are trying to get out while they still can. Russian artillery shelling is intensifying, so families grabbed anything they could carry. I don't want to go and leave everything behind, she said, but there's no other choice. When Russian soldiers were driven out of places they controlled near Kyiv, such as Bucha, the world was appalled by what many claim are war crimes, civilians cut down by Russian soldiers and their bodies left to rot in the streets. The Kremlin's leadership is continuing with its absurd claims that it's all staged or faked, but the head of NATO is warning such awfulness will continue as Vladimir Putin is showing no signs of backing off. We have seen no indication that uh, President Putin has uh, changed his ambition to control uh, the whole of Ukraine uh, and also to rewrite uh, the international order. So we need to be prepared for a long uh, haul. In other areas recently freed of Russian control, survivors are telling more horror stories. The Russians were getting bombarded, said this woman from a village near the Chernobyl nuclear plant. As Ukrainian soldiers counterattacked, the residents say the Russians herded them into a school at gunpoint to act as human shields. Maria survived the Second World War. They were like the Germans, she said, but they spoke Russian, so I knew what they were saying. Mariupol may yet become the greatest atrocity. Ukrainian officials say tens of thousands of people may still be trapped without the necessities of life. Red Cross buses managed to get 1,000 or so people out. For many, it was the first contact they've had with the outside world in weeks. Mariupol has become a graveyard, said this woman. All of the neighborhoods are covered with the graves of civilians. Mariupol's mayor is warning Russian forces may already be working to try to cover up just how awful the loss of life is there. He says Russia is bringing in mobile crematorium trucks to burn bodies, although there's no independent confirmation of that. Chris Brown, CBC News, Lviv. The atrocities revealed this week have triggered more sanctions on Russia. But as Paul Hunter explains, while European countries are targeting Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine, they are also helping to fund it. From Joe Biden at this event in Washington, images of Bucha, Ukraine, fresh in his mind, condemnation. Again, labeling the massacre a war crime. Civilians executed in cold blood. Adding details on fresh U.S. sanctions against Russia and this renewed pledge. We're going to keep raising the economic cost and ratchet up the pain for Putin. The U.S. now officially targeting more of Russia's biggest banks and, separately, sanctioning Vladimir Putin's two adult daughters. This is Katerina at an economic forum last year in St. Petersburg. Underlining Western solidarity, the European Union now with its own new sanctions, adding it may also now look at targeting Russian energy exports, a complicated step for Europe, which relies so heavily on Russian oil and gas. Europe can continues to pay Russia a billion euros a day for its energy. Since the beginning of the war, said EU High Representative Joseph Borrell today, we've given Putin 
35 billion euros. Compare that, he said, to the 1 billion we've given Ukraine in arms and weapons. Meanwhile, from the U.S. Justice Department, a signal that sanctions are by no means empty threats, with charges now laid against a Russian oligarch for violating earlier sanctions. It does not matter how far you sail your yacht. It does not matter how well you conceal your assets. The Justice Department will use every available tool to find you, disrupt your plots, and hold you accountable. Despite all the sanctions, Joe Biden now warns this war could continue for a long time. As Ukraine's president says, these latest sanctions, quote, look spectacular, but are not enough. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Well, turning now to Canadian politics and the increasingly packed field of conservative leadership hopefuls. Today, the ranks swelled again. Pierre Poilievre was the first to jump in, followed by other big names like Leslin Lewis, Jean Charest, and Patrick Brown, with more joining or expressing interest. And now the count is at least 11, with Leona Alislev, a former liberal, announcing her bid today. Hannah Thibodeau takes us inside the crowded race. It's still early in the conservative leadership race, but Pierre Poilievre seems to have momentum. Wow! Thank you, thank you. Hundreds turning out to hear his populist message. Be enough, be enough. Promising things like axing the carbon tax and ending all COVID restrictions. Everybody, John got his membership. Well, Polyev's pitch inspired John Charles to join the party. We have lost our freedoms in many ways and he's kind of standing up and giving us back a kind of a hope. But there are a large number of leadership hopefuls. Now the 11th. I'm running for leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. Leona Alislev is a former Liberal who crossed the floor in 2018 to join the Conservatives. We need a strong Conservative Party and we need a strong leader for the future. Former Quebec Premier Jean Charest's slogan is built to win. But so far his events aren't drawing the big numbers. Charest has secured just 11 MP endorsements compared to Polyev's 50 though not everyone endorses the perceived frontrunner's negative style. I don't think we need to stir up anger in Canada. I don't think we should be tapping into that. As leader of the Conservative Party of Canada. Patrick Brown, mayor of Brampton, Ontario, and former Ontario Progressive Conservative leader says he can grow the party and win a general election. MP Leslin Lewis is making her second bid for leader. In 2020, she raised more money and support than expected. And again, she's drawing good-sized crowds. But it isn't all about crowd size. If people attend a meeting, but they don't provide their information, they don't sign up to take out a membership, then they won't get to vote. We won't know who wins until September 10th, but whoever does become leader could be relegated to opposition benches until 2025 because of the deal the Liberals struck with the NDP. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, there's a warning tonight for those getting ready to buy Easter treats. Those Kinder Brand chocolate products you see on your screen are being recalled due to possible salmonella contamination. There have been no reported illnesses here in Canada, but people are being advised not to eat these products and to return them where they were purchased. Well, several provinces are dealing with outbreaks of a deadly bird flu. While it rarely infects humans, millions of birds were culled because of the same disease in recent years. And again, this time, it could do major damage to the poultry industry. Katie Nicholson explains. So anyone that is near ducks or geese that are migrating uh, have a chance of walking in poop. And the poop is what carries it. To enter Karen Woolley's hen house, you have to take off your shoes and put on these crocs. Chicks and ducks. Woolley has hundreds of birds on her farm near Peterborough. These hens only a small part of her collection, all of them being kept indoors to keep them safe from the latest strain of the avian flu. They're caged up. I mean, I kind of nickname this chicken COVID, although it's not COVID, but it's the same type of locking down the farm for chickens, locking down the farm from gas. It's already hit another farm not far from here and devastated the flock. If it comes to our farm, we would have to uh, put down any chicken that didn't die, any duck or geese, goose that didn't die. They would all be gone. Twelve farms have had confirmed cases of the virus, including a half dozen under quarantine in Ontario. Cases have been found in Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and in Quebec in wild birds. 
Countless other farms are locked down like Woolies because of their proximity. It's hardly the first time. It is disruptive to the complete value chain. Uh, we have a reduction in our ability to supply birds uh, to the local supermarkets in those areas. But don't worry, says this bird immunologist, the poultry that is in the supply chain should be safe. It's extremely, extremely unlikely for this virus to find its way to human food. And even if it does, in the unlikely event that it happens, heating could kill the virus. Back on her farm, Wooly spots a wild goose and is ready to release the hounds. We will send these dogs down to chase it away later on. And hopefully keep her farm avian flu free. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Buckhorn, Ontario. Well, shoppers at a Montreal plaza are raising questions after getting their cars towed minutes after parking. Said, so if you pay, I will call the guy who is the towing guy. Then he will tell you where is your car. Coming up, a CBC investigation reveals the demand for cash and the unusual place shoppers found their cars. Plus, Ed Sheeran fought a plagiarism lawsuit and won, but he says there's a bigger issue at play. I feel like claims like this are way too common now. And congratulations, you are new Jeopardy champion. A Nova Scotia woman's big surprise over her big win. I absolutely had to get that one right. We're back in two. Church bells in Humboldt, Saskatchewan rang today to mark four years since the fatal crash that killed 16 people and injured 13. The Humboldt Broncos hockey team was traveling to a playoff game when a bus hit a semi-truck that blew through a stop sign. Well, many shopping mall parking lots have signs saying they are only for customers. But a CBC News investigation found a Montreal plaza is towing cars quickly, sometimes within minutes of parking. As Leah Hendry explains, drivers returned to find their cars gone and had to pay to get them back. It took me less than uh, 10 minutes. Pierre Abraham Malemba says he was headed to the pharmacy at the Gallery Norgate Mall, but first went across the street to get money from an ATM. When he returned, his SUV was gone. He spotted a number for a towing company. When he called, he was told to go talk to someone sitting in the parking lot. He said, so if you pay, I will call the guy who is the towing guy. He will come, then he will tell you where is your car. Malemba says he paid $116 to get his vehicle back but then found it on a nearby residential street. Unsettled, he contacted CBC News to look into it. Over the course of two days last week, we saw the operator towing cars quickly, in some cases in just 10 or 15 seconds. In a single hour last week, the operator towed five cars from the lot, each time dropping them on a nearby street. Some drivers who had their cars towed told us they had never even left the shopping plaza. Others had left for five or ten minutes to go to a nearby shop. To get back their vehicles, drivers paid a woman idling in an SUV in the parking lot anywhere from $87 to $133. It's a bad reputation for the business and the area. Under Montreal's towing bylaw, drivers can face a fee of $89 and an additional $30 for storage, but only if the vehicle is stored for six hours or more. Companies also have to tell drivers where their vehicle is. A spokesman for Crofton Moore, the company that manages Gallery Norgate, said cars are immediately towed if a person is seen leaving the site, as stated on signs around the lot. He said the policy is meant to stop people from using the lot to hop on the metro or shop elsewhere. As for the seemingly arbitrary amounts people were charged, he said their towing operator knows the bylaws and anyone with complaints should contact Crofton Moore. Leah Hendry, CBC News, Montreal. Well, if the B.C. government gets its way, new guidelines could spell the end of traditional bake sales and hot dog days at school. The proposed changes are for food offered or sold to students from kindergarten to grade 12. And as Renee Filipponi reports, while the province says its goal is to improve nutrition, some say it's going too far. It's lunchtime, and these Vancouver students, off campus and enjoying pizza, bite when asked about BC's new health policy for schools. I think, you know, they should encourage healthy food more at our school. 
but also have like some some break days because everyone loves a good cheat day, you know? I think having healthy food is going to help people focus more. There's already a guide for what cafeterias should sell, but this new proposal goes further. It would apply to school and parent organized activities like fairs, sporting events and bake sales and advises to avoid favorite treats like cookies, popsicles, processed meat, juice and anything fried. We're going to be working this through with parents and making sure that we improve the quality of food and food education in our school system. The new policy doesn't cover food children bring from home, but it's still facing criticism from some parents who say it's a form of food shaming and will impact their ability to fundraise. So we're in the schools and we're, we're fundraising through our hot lunches and our freezy days and whatnot to in order to get additional technology for our students to replace our sports equipment. And with inflation sending grocery prices up, there are also concerns it could further marginalize students and schools in lower income areas. There are lots of people in this province living within poverty and the foods that are considered healthy on this list are very expensive. Advocates for healthy eating support the changes but say they need to be subsidized. We really want to make sure that these guidelines as a gold standard um, are accompanied with resources and support for school districts and communities. The province is accepting feedback until the end of the month and will publish the final guidelines later this year. Schools can decide whether to adopt them. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, after the break, we get on the train to safety. You will hear from people escaping Ukraine's war-torn areas. I can't say that I'm not afraid. I'm afraid. The families that had to leave everything behind. Next. According to the latest numbers from the UN, about a quarter of Ukraine's 44 million people are fleeing the war. That's 4.2 million refugees who have left the country and another 7.1 million displaced within Ukraine. And many are relying on trains. The country's rail network is one of the most extensive in the world, still largely intact. And as Susan Ormiston shows us, for a nation on the move, it has become a refuge all its own. Waiting for the train to arrive and the war to end. The railways never stopped, a one-way lifeline to safety. But as the war grinds on, some Ukrainians are making the precarious journey back. Each has a story. <laughs> Olga and Eva plan to wait out the war in Sweden, but first she wants to see her husband, a soldier from Kharkiv, just for a few days before they part. What do I worry about? What will happen to him if he will be alive? We will pray for him. He can't leave and she must. She worries about how to cope. Our fate will be in a different city, different country. He will be in Ukraine until the end because he is the military. In the early days of this war, there were almost no passengers on these trains going east toward the fighting. But as Ukrainians adjust to the reality of potentially a long war, some are finding reasons to go back. Life as a sudden refugee is too difficult, says Yana Hunterenko, who with her four kids and five pets fled Ukraine to the Czech Republic weeks ago. The children started to cry that they wanted to go home and we decided that home is better than somewhere else. They're returning to their home in central Ukraine with two budgies, two hamsters and a rat, hoping they'll all be safe. I saw how it's abroad. It's better to stay and support our people. Please understand, if we will not believe, then nobody will believe in us. If it's not us and our children standing with Ukraine, then there will be nobody else to help Ukraine. And then this war will continue. Every Ukrainian is trying to decipher what they can do to help their country. Ihor Mariko is from Zaporizhia in the east. Still dangerous, but with family there, he can't stay away anymore. 
Is it safe? I can't say that I'm not afraid. I'm afraid. I'm not afraid about uh, maybe bomber or aircraft attack. I'm uh, afraid of uh, uh, not be able to leave the area because as in Mariupol, Kharkiv, people just were staying like hostages. For those who work the trains, like Nadia Zimkovska, the war has turned them into aid workers on evacuation trains. Nadia has been with the railway 31 years. She's never been frightened before. Yes, it was scary. The trains were under shelling. We stopped in Zaporizhia. In Kyiv, we stopped for four hours and we could hear shelling. During the panic days of evacuation, she tells us the carriages were jammed with families. She remembers one father whose wife had died. A father was evacuating with two children. His third child got lost. He walked through the whole train, 20 carriages, and he never found his child. There's trauma on this train, lots of it. In one carriage, we notice Anna Blashenko and her son Pavel exhausted, with her husband and father escaping from a month of terror in Mariupol. When she wakes, she tells us. You were in the basement? In the last couple of days before we left, it was scary to go to the basement. We had no strength. It seems that we were going to the grave. Emotionally, you are scared all the time. Shots, rockets, bombs, those sounds of war, they didn't stop. Did you think you wouldn't get out alive? Yes, everyone thought that. There were moments when we thought it would be better if some rocket fell and kill us. As long as it happened fast, because we saw many deaths, lots of destructions and suffering. People suffered. They're all going together to a village in central Ukraine. We are wanderers now, she says. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back to Mariupol? No, there is no Mariupol anymore. No city, no infrastructures, there is not even one building, no hospital, no shops. The city is alive because there is life in the basement, but there is no Mariupol. At Hamelninsky, Anna's family gets off to find a new refuge inside their own country. And as night comes, nearly halfway across Ukraine, the war feels closer. An air raid siren warns of some threat in the sky, but the trains keep running, snaking across the country they keep lights low, the station's dark, trying to protect the rails from direct attacks. As the Russians withdraw from around Kyiv, the night trains are moving some people back in. But they're still rescuing frightened families from bomb cities like Chernihiv. This is madness. In the 21st century, how can this happen? We never touched anyone. We lived and raised children. And they came to us with the war. They bombed us, they forced us to starve. This is horrible. It's difficult to comprehend. Maria Krasnopolska and her daughter are escaping. She's angry. Yes, I am not an evil person, but what they do makes me very mad. Do you think you'll be able to go back to Chernihiv and when? Yes, for sure, after the victory. This is my home, the home of my children. We will be there. And when it's time, the night conductor, Mihailo Kravchuk, will escort them back. He's been working the rails since Ukraine's independence from the Soviet Union. And the war is part of his mission. We just do our work. In such difficult times, everyone needs to do what they do best. Soldiers to shoot, military to fight, someone to conduct the train, a president to lead. President what? It's a trickle now. 
But already the trains are carrying Ukrainians back to reclaim whatever they can of their war-torn country. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Hemelnitsky, Ukraine. Well, next on The National, CBC News investigates the alarming rise of a far-right Hindu movement in Canada. Rather disturbing emails accusing me of being a Taliban sympathizer and telling me that they were in my backyard. We'll hear from Canadians now facing threats and intimidation. Next. More than a dozen Canadian academics say they have been threatened and harassed for their work covering Indian society and politics. They say supporters of a Hindu nationalist movement are trying to shut down criticism. As Judy Trin reports, in one case, the threats were so extreme, a professor is now carrying a panic button. For the past five years, Carleton University professor Chinaya Jangam has received thousands of hate messages. The emails and phone calls come from people angry with his research on India's caste system. Hate mails is like a regular phenomena for me. Jangam is Dalit, a so-called untouchable from the lowest strata of the Hindu caste system. He says he's been shouted down during lectures and accused of intellectual terrorism. To protect his family, he limits his social media presence but continues to speak out. No one can silence me because, you know, this is my passion, this is my life. Jagam says he's being intimidated by supporters of Hindutva, a political ideology that seeks to transform India into a Hindu nation. It's a view supported by the current government under Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The Muslims, the Christians, the Buddhists, they all came afterwards. And so they, their rights and their aspirations, their hopes are, have to be subjugated to some degree to the Hindu majority. Stephen Zhou researches far-right movements. Zhou says in India, Hindu nationalism has led to sectarian violence and the banning of hijabs in schools. Has Hindutva ideology become violent here in Canada? It has become rhetorically violent. In Canada, attempts to shut down criticism of Hindutva and Indian politics has led to police complaints. Kristen Pliss, the head of South Asian Studies at the University of Toronto, now carries a panic button. She became a target after U of T participated in a conference last fall called Dismantling Hindutva. Hindus are the most peaceful people on the face of earth. Demonstrators protested the conference on campus, which was endorsed by more than 50 universities, including Harvard, Stanford and six in Canada. Afterwards, Pliss began receiving threatening emails from a Hindu advocacy group in Toronto. There was one group that's based in the GTA, a Hindu group, that sent me um, rather disturbing emails accusing me of being a Taliban sympathizer and telling me that they were in my backyard um, and then started sending me food delivery uh, gift certificates, which crossed a line that other um, emails had not. Pliss says campus security believed the food delivery card was an attempt to get her address. She says the harassment upended her life and she reported it to police. When they are presenting Hindu studies to students, right, it's almost borderline disdain, borderline contempt. Gopala Krishna is with the group, Dwarpalakas. He sent the emails and the food card. He accuses Pliss and the university of being Hindu phobic. They open up this onslaught, one after one, one after one, and then they get hit back. And when they get hit back, they immediately cry, oh, academic freedom, we have concerns. So the moment they start treating Hindus with respect, this would subside, this would ebb away. That's my strong conviction. CBC spoke to 16 other Canadian academics who say they've been harassed by Hindutva groups aligned with the BJP, India's governing party. Most don't want to be identified. They're worried about more harassment. Others are concerned their visas to India will be denied. Some are worried that speaking out will put their families there at risk. Judy Trin, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, after the break, Ed Sheeran hits back against copyright lawsuits. Is it plagiarism or just coincidence? Plus, you have $32,001. Congratulations.
<laughs> we speak to the Canadian with not one but two wins already under her belt. Welcome back. Eugene Levy is among those paying tribute to renowned Canadian conductor Boris Brat. Brat was artistic director and conductor of the Orchestra Classique de Montréal, but he's best known for the two decades he led the Hamilton Philharmonic. Brat was killed Tuesday in a hit and run on a street near his Hamilton home. A makeshift memorial has been growing since then. Eugene Levy says Brat's brilliance was surpassed by his kindness. Boris Brat was 78. Singer-songwriter Ed Sheeran has won a copyright suit over his mega-hit Shape of You. He was accused of lifting a riff from another musician's song. But despite the victory, Sheeran is lashing out over a rising chorus of plagiarism allegations. Here's Deanna Sumanak-Johnson. Ed Sheeran has been saying for a while, those four little O-I's are nothing like artist Sammy Switch's four O-Y's. And now a British court agrees he did not deliberately copy that musical hook. Coincidence is bound to happen if 60,000 songs are being released every day on Spotify. That's 22 million songs a year and there's only 12 notes that are available. Sheeran went on to say copyright infringement suits against stars have been way too common lately. Many experts say one lawsuit in 2015 started the rush. Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams paid $7 million after a court said their hit Blurred Lines copied the feel of Marvin Gaye's Gotta Give It Up. It was a controversial verdict, uh, one that I feel was incorrect. Um, and it, it really basically um, let people believe that a vibe or a feel um, was protectable. Another reason such lawsuits could be more common, because nowadays it's tougher to claim that one artist had no way of hearing the song of another. Now, it's very hard to argue effectively and convincingly that you have had no access to a work, that you couldn't possibly have copied it, because almost every work is available and could have been accessed. But we shouldn't assume the little guy is always in it for the money, says this music journalist. I think there has been an increase, um, but I think it's because indie artists have more resources than they used to, or um, better versed in the law than they used to be as well. Despite Sheeran's victory, musical copyright infringement cases aren't going to subside. In fact, he himself is facing another one over another song in the U.S. Deanna Suenak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, some Olympic news for you. CBC and Radio Canada will remain your home for Olympic coverage for at least another decade. The new partnership with the International Olympic Committee was announced just today. It includes exclusive broadcast rights for the network through 2032, but does not yet include the Paralympics, which are still being discussed. Okay, after the break, a Jeopardy win that is making Nova Scotians proud. You have $32,001. Congratulations. <laughs> That's a pretty penny. We meet the newest champion in our moment. Next. Well, a Nova Scotia woman is having a bit of a moment on Jeopardy. Matea Roach has two wins under her belt, and she is hoping to keep that winning streak going. It is our moment. This is Jeopardy! I have very fond memories of watching Jeopardy uh, in junior high and high school. And so to get the opportunity to compete on this show that I've been watching for such a long time was like a huge honor. I'll take dogs for 12. The writers are often clever. There'll be puns or little wordplay type hints in the clues that are helping to direct you towards the right answer. Nova Scotia duck tolling is one breed of this sporting dog for whom fetch should be instinctual. Matea. What is Retriever? I absolutely had to get that one right. And as soon as I saw that clue come up on the board, I was like, oh, shoot. Like, if I don't ring in, if one of these other people answers this question, I'm never going to hear the end of it at home. I knew I was going to give it my best shot, but to actually be not just a Jeopardy contestant, but a Jeopardy champion is a pretty amazing feeling, I have to say. You have $32,001. Congratulations. You are our new Jeopardy champion. I was shocked. I was so excited my mind was blown 
You heard her saying there, right? After she won, I'm going to pay my student debt off. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, and then some. So, you know, she hasn't just been winning. She's been absolutely crushing the competition in tonight's game. So the final Jeopardy question was this. French, Italian, and Swiss nationals make up about half of its population of 38,000. She answered correctly, uh, finishing with $38,800 in final Jeopardy. The closest second place competitor, $3. The answer was... Uh, Monaco. What is what is Monaco? This is why I would never make a good Jeopardy player. That's the national for this April 6th. Have a great night.